Hey everybody, I want to make a short little video on how to write chemical formulas. The past couple days in class we spent a lot of time talking about how atoms on the periodic table are neutral. And we were very careful to say that to, to describe a neutral atom is something that it means it has an equal number of protons and electrons. And protons are the things that have a, let's go with a uh, blue here, protons have a plus one charge electrons have a negative one charge. And we said you really want to start thinking about that charge as a real thing, like something you could hold in your hand. And if you do that, then it's easier to get through the kind of the weirdness about it. Because if you take an ordinary neutral atom, and I'm going to draw an atom like, I'm just going to draw a sodium atom. So give me a sec. So sodium has 11 electrons, and we've got to put those electrons somewhere. So I can put two electrons in the first shell, and then I have a second shell here, and then there's going to be eight electrons. I'm going to pause and draw them all in. Okay, so there's my second shell with eight. So I have eight in the second, two in the first, that's ten. I need a third shell. So sodium can have a third shell, and it has one electrons in it. And I just said electrons, I meant electron. So now you got to ask, is sodium a bedding atom? Is it going to be easier for sodium to gain seven electrons to get a full outer shell or to lose seven electrons. So we all agreed that it's best for sodium to actually lose this outer shell electron. If, if it does, something interesting happens. If sodium loses that outer shell electron, it just goes somewhere. And for, for the time being, we'll kind of forget where it might go. But if it loses it, then sodium has a chance to become stable. If this outer shell is gone, then the next inner shell becomes the outer shell essentially. And if you count, it's got its eight electrons in there. So now at this point, sodium has become an ion and that ion is stable. Well, there's a little bit more that goes along with it, but we can assume right now, full outer shell, it's stable. But because it's gotten rid of a negative charge, it becomes positive. And I'm gonna to wanna to explain how that works. Sodium starts out with 11 protons. It starts out with 11 electrons. Each proton has a positive one charge, so that basically ends, allows me to end up with a positive 11 charge. The electrons work the opposite way. Each electron is a negative one charge. If I add them all up, I get a negative 11 charge. Do the math, you end up with zero. And as we said before, uh, a neutral atom is gonna have zero extra charge left over. Now, when sodium loses the electron, that's when the magic happens. We now have, cross this off, we have 10 electrons, and we now cross this off, we now have a minus 10 charge. And now if you do the math, plus 11, um, plus minus 10, you don't end up with zero anymore, you end up with plus one. So that's a really interesting concept. If you give something away, if you lose something, you become positive. And that's not how we normally used to thinking about this. That's why I say, Think of charge as a, re as a real thing, like something you could hold in your hands. Okay, good. We end up with a positive one charge. And the way we write that for sodium is Na with A plus one. Now, you may see this written slightly differently. Some books, some sheets, if something is just a plus one charge, they're just going to say Na plus. Other places will write Na one plus. Um, I'm, I kind of like this a little bit better. Just be aware, some of your ion charts that I've given you have, have, have them written out like this and this. So just, just, just know that they exist. Okay, so I'm gonna erase some of this and just give us a fresh screen. Now, fast forward to something we talked about last week. It turns out some atoms are very, very predictable in terms of whether they are going to lose electrons and gain electrons. And we can kind of use those things as a pattern over and over again. And so atoms on this tight side of the periodic table tend to lose electrons. Remember, if you lose an electron, you become positive. Um, boron and group 13 also fits into this category. Group 14 is, can kind of go either way, but you know, there's a lot of things going on here. Carbon and silicon are not really the same type of atom. Carbon is what we call a, a non-metal. Silicon is a metalloid. Germanium is a metalloid, and then tin and lead are really metals. 
So there's not a really clear pattern for here. So you really want to kind of leave this as like a little star or something to watch out for. But we jump over to group 15, 16, and 17, and these are all atoms that will end up taking electrons. And remember, the goal of losing an electron or taking an electron is to get a full outer shell and become stable. Okay, so I don't want you to just kind of see what happens here. Let's go back to sodium. We said sodium becomes an ion that becomes a plus one charge overall. So I'm kind of drawing a little sodium ion here. We can pro I'm trying to draw a sphere, but I'm terrible at drawing spheres. So sodium becomes a plus one charge. Imagine that sodium gives that electron to something over here in group 17, something like chlorine. Chlorine is a type of atom which can take an electron. If it takes an electron, it becomes a negative one charge. So let me draw chlorine here. Here's chlorine, and chlorine is a negative one charge. Now, the real beauty behind this is, yes, both of these will become stable, they'll get a full outer shell, but now I've got two opposite charges, and we all know what happens to opposites. Opposites attract. So these two atoms will apply a force on each other, and then they will stick and form a compound, an ionic compound, which will uh, be very, very stable altogether, much more stable than either the sodium or the chlorine were initially. So we can take these two things. I can take a plus one, and I can balance it with a minus one. And I always tell people, you know, kind of do the math. What's the math? If you're looking at a plus one charge here and a minus one charge here, what do those two things equal? You know, plus one plus a minus one equals zero. So the beauty here is we end up with a neutral compound. Let me write that. So the goal of gaining electrons or losing electrons is ultimately to form a neutral compound, which is really, really stable. And, and frankly, sodium chloride tastes delicious. So when we write this as a chemical formula, we do something very specific. First of all, we don't take a look at the charges at all in the formula. I just simply write down the first ion or atom that's present and write down the second ion or atom that's present, and that's it. That's the formula for sodium chloride. Right. So now we want to do something a little bit more difficult. Let's take take an atom from, let's say, a plus two and a, I'm going to use a minus one. So let me erase this and, and get a clean slate. Okay, so I left this information over here partic in particular because that's where we want to end up. But let's pick an atom like, uh, how about magnesium? And magnesium happens to be a plus two charge. It means it gets rid of two electrons. And I want to actually pair that up with a minus one. And I'm just going to pick a random minus one here. I'm going to pick fluorine, just because you may not be familiar with it. So I'm going to write fluorine here. And fluorine is a minus one charge. Now keep in mind, if you're actually writing a chemical formula, you probably don't have to do this. You're probably going to see the math and just go right to the chemical formula. But this is really nice because it kind of helps you along in the analysis stage. So do the math right now. Does a plus two plus a minus one get you to zero? And most people are going to say no. So what could I do to make it work? I need another minus one charge. I can't do anything to the magnesium. I can't do anything to the fluorine to change the charge. I can only add extra ions. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to add an additional fluorine, an additional minus one. Now if you do the math, plus two, plus minus one, plus minus one, you end up at zero. You end up with a neutral compound. So we have to find a way to write this. Now, uh, again, when you write a chemical formula, you don't write in the charges. You don't write in these things right here. All right, Those things are called charges. Another fancy name for them are oxidation numbers, but that's a little bit ahead of the game. So to write a chemical formula, we, we, we kind of have a little shorthand notation. And you know, it's a little confusing at first. We don't expect people to know exactly all the rules. But in general, when you write a chemical formula, you always write the metal ion first. Okay? So magnesium is a metal, and we write the metal ion first. But now we have a choice. I've got two fluorines. How do we represent that? Well, I'm just going to write the element symbol down here for fluorine. Um, how do we represent this? Uh, some people say I could put a big 2 inside here, or I could put a big 2 over here, but actually the way we write this is we use a subscript. And we always put the subscript to the right, the bottom right of wherever that atom belongs. So because I have two fluorines in this compound, I'm going to write MgF and then the 2. Now I know that whenever I look at a compound like this, 
this subscript only applies to the fluorine. It does not apply to the magnesium at all. And in a way, it's telling me how many of each atom is present in the formula. So I want to come back to here a minute. I said we usually start writing the chemical formula with the metal. We usually end with the non-metal. Okay? So that's the rules. That's the rules for writing a chemical formula. And so let's do another one. By the way, I just noticed over here that I didn't finish the word take. I, I, these atoms tend to lose electrons. These atoms tend to take electrons. I must have got lost in my train of thought. So let's do something a little bit more difficult here. I want to take an atom that's plus one charge. How about we pick potassium? Potassium forms a plus one. And let's pair it with something different. How about we pair it with nitrogen? Nitrogen forms a minus three charge. And I'm just going to put the nitrogen kind of over here. You might be figuring out what I'll be able to do with it. Okay. So if you do the math right now with between potassium and nitrogen, you're going to see you don't end up at zero. You have to do something else. You can't change the charge of an atom or ion at all. The only thing I can do is add more or less. So what I'm going to choose to do is add more. I'm going to add two more potassiums. I'll put a K plus one here, and I'm writing it kind of funny just because I didn't give myself enough room, and a K plus one there. So if I have three K plus ones, that'll offset a minus three and end up with a neutral compound. All right, so how do I write this one? Uh, metal ion first, followed by non-metal. But you gotta ask yourself, how many do you have of each? Do you have three nitrogens or do you have three potassiums? I got three potassiums. Remember, I can't put a number out in front. I have to put this in as a subscript. And there it is, K3N. Now, a little bit later, you're going to learn how to name these chemical formulas. But for now, we're just going to leave it as is. Okay? Okay, now, we know how to make a compound. We know how to balance the charge. We know we need to get to zero. What about the polyatomic ions? Now, these are also called radicals, and that's the way I sort of talked about them. But I like the word polyatomic better instead because poly means many. So it's a many atom ion. And if we look right here, here's uh, one of my favorite many atom ions is nitrate. The nitrate ion is this. I'm going to write it over again down here. Nitrate is NO3, which means this thing, and sometimes we put this into parentheses, just going to help us isolate it. This big thing, this big polyatomic ion, contains four things. It contains a nitrogen, and there's three oxygen atoms stuck to it. Now, the charge is written up top. The minus one charge actually pertains to everything that's in here as a whole. So nitrogen is going to have a different charge than oxygen is. But all added together, all the positives and negatives added together add up to a minus one. So in a way, we can use this to write new chemical formulas. In fact, I want to use this right here. I want to write nitrate, and I want to use this as my negative one ion. All right, and I'm going to go back to my periodic table, and I got my periodic table over here. Let's say I'm going to go make this difficult from the start. I am just going to go and pick a plus two ion. I'm going to pick calcium, and there it is. I've got my charge here. So for the time being, forget about everything. This may look very confusing if you haven't done this before, but just look at the math. How do I make the math equal zero? I have a plus two ion, I have a negative one, I need to make it zero. The only way to do that is to have more negative ones. And in this case, it means in this particular formula, I need to have a second nitrate. So I need to have a second nitrate. Now, I want to write the chemical formula for this. Remember, we're going to have to use subscripts. And for now, we're actually, in order to keep things simple, we're actually going to have to use a parentheses around our radical. So I write my starting unit. And because I know I need two of these things, I'm just going to put a parentheses around the nitrate. There's my NO3, end parentheses, and now the subscript. Because I have two nitrates, I need to have a subscript too. And there we go. That is the chemical formula for calcium nitrate. Okay? So you can build a complete chemical formula with... Basically, as long as you know what positive, what negative charges you're going to use, there's no limit to the formula you can make, all right? I want to give you a couple little kind of tips. Okay, here's a couple more rules that are not immediately obvious to people. 
when they want to write a chemical formula, they get really into this, and they, they may take a negative ion or a, a radical like carbonate, and carbonate is a, is a altogether is a minus two charge, and they want to pair it with a positive. So they start off with potassium, which is a plus one, and they realize, oh, I need another plus one to make it equal to zero. So they say, well, I'll just go and pick lithium. So I'll have a compound Ki, Li plus one, CO3. Here's a problem. And this, I don't expect people to know this, and I don't expect people to know why, but not all com possible combinations that actually ended up equal equaling zero actually form. And it turns out the compound potassium, lithium, carbonate, eh, doesn't really form. It turns out these atoms would rather stick together. I'll either have a formula that looks like this, Li2CO3, or I'll have the formula K2CO3. But in general, I'm not going to have LiKCO3. I just realized I flipped this from K and Li, but so in general, this type of formula is not going to happen. And again, if if you if you chose it as a response, I'm probably not going to mark you wrong right now, but it's just one of those things as we gain experience, you start to see things that weren't there before. Okay, I hope this helps. I'm going to make a more advanced video later, but for now, um, take a look, practice this over and over again. I think you guys will see that uh, it's not that bad. All right, see ya.